Jim Collison, we are live from Infotech 2014. Uh, we are again doing a series where we talk about talk to the keynotes and session speakers. I'm with Matthew Monahan. He is the morning keynote on Tuesday morning, Infotech 2014, here in Omaha. And Matthew, thanks for taking a few minutes to interview with us. Thanks today. for having me. Um, I got a chance to listen to your keynote and uh, five points that you had. I'm really interested in point number one. Uh, we mentioned millennials, and, and I mentioned to you, I feel like maybe I'm one of the oldest millennials um, out there, but um, you mentioned that the millennials are rising up, and uh, Jody and I do a lot of recruiting, and so we're on the college campuses. We're out recruiting like you are. We're competing for the resources that, that uh, you have as well. Talk a little bit about some of the trends you're seeing in, in millennials uh, with the organization. Maybe before you do that, talk a little bit about yourself, what you do, and your, and your company. Sure. Um, we run a company called Inflection, and essentially we have uh, seven years now been building products inside the uh, big data space hmm. and so everything around our personal identities, people search, employment screening, uh, we were heavy in the family history space for a number of years until we uh, sold that business to Ancestry.com. So we're headquartered in Silicon Valley, uh, we've got about 200 people across four offices now uh, around the world and we're having, we're having a lot of fun. And you mentioned uh, you're, in Silicon, you're in the Silicon Valley as well as in Omaha. As which well is as in Omaha, Silicon yeah. Prairie, we've got about 50 individuals here and uh, we started the office in Omaha in 2008, and uh, it's just been growing like crazy ever since. And we love we love the Midwest. We love the values of uh, the people here, and um, you know they are our customer facing uh, representation. So it's uh, it's something that's very important to us. Did you find what did you find about Omaha that you like here? Why Omaha? What what was it that brought you here? You know, honestly, we started the search from the context of who who would lead the office. Mm -hmm. um, so we, our philosophy is to start with the leaders, and um, and to you know build new locations that way. And so when we met Michelle Steinbeck, who came out of LinkedIn, um, we knew we had we knew we had our winner. So we had interviews with folks in Utah and Idaho and so forth. But it was it was really the people that ultimately made the decision, not the lack of direct flights. Um, and <laughs> so, we're getting better though. We do have a direct it flight It is, from and Seattle. the flight last night was easy. So we've. <laughs> We we've got people going back and forth every few months. And it's been great. I, I'd also just say, you know, the Chamber of Commerce was hugely supportive uh, when we made the move, and they came out to our offices in California. We saw them here in Omaha, and I like to joke with people: it was easier to open an office in Omaha than it was in California from California. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really just about the people and the friendly culture. Yeah, good. You also mentioned you have an office in Ukraine, and of course that's, that's right. been a little interesting. Uh, you know, situation over there on the way over here. You'd mentioned you'd offer to bring some of those folks back just until things settle down over there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fingers crossed for uh, things to to de-escalate and get get a little bit more peaceful over there. But um, but yeah, we have some amazing engineering talent in Ukraine, and we find that Ukraine graduates, you know, some of the um, just really most adept folks in, in the computer science fields uh, and math fields that, that we've been able to find. Very cool. And what other locations, or do you have any other locations? Yeah, we, we acquired a business last year in Israel, in Tel Aviv. So we have uh, seven individuals in Tel Aviv as well, and they, they're also just phenomenal. Another hub of IT there in Israel. Totally. That's great. Totally. Have you looked at Argentina at all? I've heard that's another up-and-coming. I would and coming. love to, but we haven't, we haven't yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've heard that's another up-and-coming. Yeah, very and, good and customer Wellington, support. Wellington, New Zealand is, is another yeah. one to, to keep yeah. an eye on. Yeah, yeah, very good. So uh, let's talk. You mentioned big data. Let's talk before we get to the millennial conversation. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, tell me what's going on because everybody right now is using that buzzword, yep. big data, uh, in, in what they're doing. Uh, tell me what, for, for you guys, what, what's, on, what's the cutting edge for you? How are you using that? Um, so, you know, when we started our business, the term big data wasn't even around. And so for us, it was just really a realization of how much information was becoming digitized. And uh, we were looking at things like historical records at court offices, state archives offices, and paper documents were moving digital. And that was really exciting uh, because now for the first time you could search it, you can access it from any device, uh, you can essentially match and link records together and really um, put things more instantaneously at anyone's fingertips. And whereas before, you know, physical only, it requires a lot more manual labor and costs and so forth. So. Um, big data, the term came in because I think everyone realized, wow, it's, it's absolutely incredible how much information is being created. Um, and, you know, there's this notion that as the hardware of our technology uh, continues to advance on accelerating curves, um, that 
will essentially continue to create information and find ways to fill it. Um, and so uh, we think that this is only going to continue. And what's cutting edge for us is just using a lot of the latest software and techniques and hiring a lot of uh, data scientists and so forth to uh, bring more intelligence to the data because I think uh, there's an enormous number of opportunities for businesses who can make sense of data, synthesize it, simplify it, organize it, and um, and create practical applications and useful applications for uh, end users. Yeah, and you're certainly in the, the epicenter of big data with companies like Google and Facebook and That's right. LinkedIn creating enormous amounts of data on their own. What are you seeing? Any technologies that you're looking at that might be future looking? Because big data is great, but if you can't get the data back, right? If you mm. can't get to it, yeah, uh, it's useless. So, what are you guys looking at, or, or how are you overcoming some of those obstacles of of getting that data back to the consumer once you've got it? Yeah, I think it's a great point. You know, we've we've seen this cloud phenomenon over the last few years, and everything. You know, cloud was the big buzzword, but um, now with the the hacks, the breaches, the surveillance, the uh, different things that are causing us to be a little bit more worried about putting all of our data into some uh, centralized cloud, uh, there's a demand and a thirst and a hunger for bringing back more control into our individual lives. And so uh, local clouds, local servers, um, almost back, uh, the pendulum swinging back in many ways, um, it, especially in respect to consumers and businesses who are sensitive to having their information out there. Um, in potentially unsecure format. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we're just at the beginning of a really interesting trend right now around privacy and encryption and security. I wouldn't be surprised if um, most of the internet is SSL encrypted within the next five years. I wouldn't be surprised if there become um, much more popular uh, phones and storage devices which are uh, essentially marketed and predicated on the value proposition of extreme privacy and extreme um, kind of uh, keeping your information uh, to yourself. So we're working on this problem in our own way with a website called identity.com and uh, essentially what we're seeking to do is create a lot more visibility into where is my information online, uh, what can people see about me, who's looking at my information, and how can I really get control of this and alerts when something happens that should cause me to be concerned or should cause me to be um, monitoring something in the ecosystem? Yeah, don't you think the next step for security is that we make the assumption that our private information is public and that we have some other key, so to speak, that locks it down, right? Two-factor is one of those ideas, right? That's right. right. Um, uh, anything you guys are thinking about forward-facing from a security standpoint? Because, hey, you know what? As much as I like to think my social security number is private, it's been leaked enough totally. that it's probably out there. So I just have to make that assumption that it's already out Yeah, I don't think that necessarily most people have gotten to that full realization that you have, but I, I would agree that um, the data is out there. And um, and it's a little bit like the cat's been out of the bag. Now, it doesn't mean that we should be any less concerned about the continued spread and proliferation, but we do have to look at new ways to authenticate people, new ways to uh, verify people are who they say they are. Um, I think the financial institutions have some progress to make around uh, ensuring that identity theft becomes uh, less of an issue uh, in terms of people being able to open new lines of credit, in terms of people able to open bank accounts, in terms of people being able to file tax returns in other people's names, because those are the really, uh, you know, costly forms of identity theft that are very pervasive right now. Um, I uh, we don't have any business affiliation with them, but I'm a huge fan of LastPass. Mm. Uh, LastPass.com is pretty yeah. cutting edge for me as a user. I find it to be an incredibly effective way to. Uh, create a single password that I don't write down anywhere, I don't um, you know, store anywhere, it's just in my head, and that can essentially get access to all of my encrypted passwords, which I can set up as incredibly complex alphanumeric passwords. And, um, and that allows me to not have to type in my password over and over and over again. It's like you log on your phone and you put in your, you know, you open the phone up and you, you put your five digits or whatever and then yeah. you, you log in your website and you put in your, you, like it feels like the internet experience is becoming password entry, password entry, password entry, password entry. And so LastPass streamlines all that, but they also add the layer. So what it does is it encrypts your passwords, um, but it, st it stores it locally on your, on your browser. So you install it locally. 
And the other cool thing about it is you can create shared folders of passwords to collaborate with teams. So this notion of, you know, what am I supposed to do if I want to give someone else a, uh, access to an account, which in organizations is super common. Right. Um, right. You can set up a shared folder. That person doesn't even have to ever see that password but can get access to um, being able to use those login credentials. So, so I'm a huge fan of what they're doing. Yeah, we've actually I have a tech podcast that I do in the evenings. Uh, once a week, and we've had them on twice in the last year and a half, two years. Really nice. Uh, Amber Gott is their marketing representative. She's been on our show a couple times, and, nice. and just a fantastic, Small world. yeah, it, we, just a fantastic uh, overview of what they do. And we, the last one, we had them on just about two months ago, which was which good, you know, cool. good timing from this standpoint. Yeah. And encourage everyone. Although even though I've had them on my show twice. I've never took and taken that weekend to dig in and make LastPass work for me. Well, especially so after what, Heartbleed, time yeah, to do it Well, now. guess what I did this weekend, right? <laughs> so I, on Saturday, I sat down. It took me about four hours, but I converted everything I had. I started, and I still haven't gotten everything. It's totally. amazing how much you have totally. online, right? And you guys are in that business, right? That whole digital totally. avatar that we have out there. My avatar, both figuratively and literally, is everywhere across the Internet. And I'm finding passwords that I use are reused. Yep. Over and over and over again, right? Because it's it's hard to remember all those passwords. And I actually created a schema too this this weekend, where I I have a set of characters that I use all the time, and then I intermix that in with some other information that helps me remember or trigger. So that because some sites I don't want, like my work laptop can't connect to LastPass, they mm. block it from mm. a, from a software standpoint. Mm. So I I have to do I have to have to remember some. Yeah, and uh, and so I think that's key. Reminds me a little bit of the days. Remember, we had P uh, computer PCs had viruses all the time, and we were worried about that. That's pretty much a, a moot point now. Right. Information security or the information totally. about you is kind of key. Let's talk a little bit about those millennials because I'm oh, yes. uh, we work a lot. Jody and I work a lot with them. You're in the midst of that. How many folks in your organization again? Uh, just under 200. About 200, and then most of those millennials. Do you think? Um, Probably, probably at least half. Yeah. yeah. And the trends that you're seeing, we joked before. I feel like I'm the oldest millennial out there because I've, you know, got, I'm on every social platform. Yeah. We're doing this, which is kind of, you know, streaming live on YouTube. Totally. Um, what, what kind of trends are you seeing uh, with, uh, them? with the millennials? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in the talk that I just gave, I, I really was trying to point out that they're, they're coming of age, and this generation that was born uh, with the technology gadgetry uh, embedded into their uh, operating system and cultural operating system, if you will. Um, they're now inside of organizations, running companies, uh, starting things, and um, and demanding new things from our, our workforce and from our um, our way of doing business. And so, uh, some of those themes are um, there's a much more um, th this notion of you know join a company like my my father, you know his generation was you join a company and you you work your way up the ladder. And you spend, you know, decades inside of the single organization, and um, it's not that millennials aren't necessarily loyal to their businesses anymore. It's just that this idea of only working in yeah. one side of an organization yeah. is just kind of a, a strange yeah. notion now. Yes, it is. Um, and I think part of that is because there's so many exciting things happening, right. and there's so many opportunities, and there's so many uh, new things that you can do. And so I think uh, businesses are going to have to calibrate for a little bit more of a rapid uh, pulse and um, and it also puts the burden on businesses to uh, continue to sell their people. And why? Why should I stay here? Why mm -hmm. should I stay in this organization? Because now I have opportunities yeah. uh, globally. Um, we we think that millennials um, are incredibly well positioned to also come up with a lot of the greatest ideas and uh, have the most. I mean, designers, developers, uh, engineers mm -hmm. of all types. You know, people coming straight out of school or skipping school, for that matter, are often um, really just faster and better at these technologies than folks who have been out in the workforce for a long time, uh, including myself. You know, I mean, people school me in the skills that I thought that I was good at. Yeah. Um, so you're like, hey, wait a minute, I own this place. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't feel that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Doesn't. Yeah. So, so yeah, those are some of the trends. Do you struggle even as a startup? Do you struggle with turnover a little bit of that because that generation is so mobile? Yeah, I think I think it's a combination of that. It's a, I mean, Silicon Valley is incredibly uh, competitive right now. Yeah. So you've always yeah. got someone, you know. The recruiter emails are going into people's inboxes every day. Yeah, cursed uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes both ways, though. You know, I mean, we're we're out recruiting and, yeah. and trying to poach talent from from the best. So, it um, it's just a fast-paced uh, you know culture, and and you have to get used to that. 
Yeah, and, and with that, do you find, so in recruiting, do you find has the, the equation changed? Is it more than just a conversation now, or do you have to provide something for them? What's the value proposition at the spot of recruiting for them? So I'll give you one of the secrets that we've used Ooh, that like we've, never, we've never revealed in this type of context. But what we found was our, our most amazing closer. So we would be offering people, um, you know, coming out of school job, and we were often competing with companies like LinkedIn or Google. Right. And uh, we're trying to figure out a way to sweeten the deal. And so, you know, this notion of a signing bonus is pretty common. We were thinking about that. But then we realized that, unfortunately, a lot of the millennials are strapped with student loan debt. And so if someone says, here's a $2,500 signing bonus or here's a $5,000 signing bonus, um, if you're a fiscally responsible individual, then you might be inclined to pay down your student debt with yeah, that money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it becomes a little bit less of an uh, attractive value proposition. And so what we did is we created this program where we said, okay, you're graduating. You've got the summer ahead. And uh, we want you to get some world travel experience. Because what we found is that everyone wants world travel, and yeah. everyone wishes they had done more of it and earlier in their life, yeah. and it's yep. great. Yep. So we give a stipend for a specific international world trip uh, as a sweetener signing oh, bonus. Nice. And so you don't have to feel this idea that you didn't pay down your student yeah. debt, uh, but you get to go travel the world uh, a bit for the summer. And people come back refreshed, recharged, rejuvenated uh, with a little bit more global experience. Yeah. Um, so that yeah. that's one of our secrets, just for just for you guys. No, that's great. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. We uh, we I always recommend that if you get a chance to go overseas. My daughter is trying to save for a trip for a you know a 12 day or 14 day trip to Europe for uh, two summers from now on a singing tour that she go and nice. It's expensive, but uh, it, yep. it, I think everyone should get overseas. I, I really totally. thought you were going down the direction when you said student loans. I thought you were going to say you uh, you were going to offer to make student loan payments as long as they stay. <laughs> right, that's an Which, idea. Not, that's, that's not a, a bad. It's a pretty good idea. That's a, yeah. Yeah. Think of retention, right? It's like totally. you don't pay it off all in one shot, but as long as you work for us, we'll make your student totally. loan payments until they're paid off. That yeah. would be a bad idea. I just thought of that right, right there. I think you're uh, And the other thing I thought you were going to say is maybe we send them to the office. You know, you, it, like in the Ukraine. I, again, not a great time to go yeah. visit Ukraine, but yeah. that being said, I thought maybe with, with companies that have global offices, yeah. maybe you go, you work in that. You know, for we office. should do more of that. Yeah, I, I think it's. It, one thing that we've noticed is that any time we go to the different offices and have people from each team go out and visit other teams, that it just gels the culture together much more effectively and it's, it's super, you know, positive ROI. Um, so, yeah, it's something we've we've started embracing more and, and you know, I think we should lean in on it even, yeah. even more so. Yeah, take it, take advantage of it. You got, you know, yeah. the infrastructure all set up. So totally. we've got uh, 40 offices in 22 countries. Wow. And uh, and that's uh, we we could probably do more of that. Yeah. You know, send those. There's your world around. tour. So, yeah. No, I, that's uh, that. That would be okay for me yeah. too. I would, I love to travel. I got to live in Europe when this I was This is a younger. global podcast, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's all, everything's global now. Speaking of everything being global, let's talk about that for your. You know, when we talk about big data and identity, yeah. Certainly, uh, you know, there's a lot of identity stuff that you've done here in the U.S. Are you reaching into other? When you talk about other pockets, Russia is certainly exploding right now with, mm. with data, and you sure. know, we think of that India and China. Are you working with those uh, countries as well? The problems that we're tackling are global problems. Um, you know, our our founding basis was predominantly in the United States because we were dealing with the U.S. public record system, and every country has a different public record mm -hmm. system. So some of the technologies could be applied, but uh, all the rules and the, the data partners and working with the government and so forth was pretty specific into North America. And um, but the cool thing about identity is we're much more about user-generated, user-curated uh, content, and that doesn't need to have any specific geographic concentration. So mm -hmm. uh, we are building identity.com to be international platform. Uh, we'll start with more focus in the United States since there's tremendous opportunity. It's what we know. It's where we're at. It's, it's where we yeah. have a lot of uh, existing base. But, um, but yeah, definitely we're thinking about... Um, those those other countries and you know our our current thesis and notion is to uh, do exactly how we did with expanding in Omaha, which is start with uh, localized leadership and find people who will open up uh, offices where we can really get uh, more embedded inside the culture and. Um, and really, you know, capture more local markets that way. Yeah, very cool. You know, two major events here in the United States that changed identity. Uh, one, we think about Ellis Island, right? Yeah, as, as the immigrants right. came in, they began Layer to standardize history. naming yep. at that point. And then the Social Security Act that changed mm. the way the number, right, associated mm. with it. 
uh, who we might be looking uh, at some of the work that you guys are doing when we talk about a global identity. Because you're right, today it is still a wild, wild west, um, so to speak, to use that term. Uh, with identity, it's different in every country and the way it's laid out. There are still pockets of the world that are totally. still very, very different totally. because we're interviewing uh, now globally. Jody and I bring in resources from all over the world. We even see naming conventions that are different, right? Very, yeah. very different. China is still very, very different. They, they handle identity a lot different than we do. That's right. So maybe some of the work, you know, maybe we'll look back 100 years from now <laughs> and say some of the work that you guys are doing, we're standardizing the we global, be so lucky. <laughs> global identity Yeah, going forward. Very cool. I want to ask you kind of one more set of questions before I let you go. And Matthew, thank you for taking the time to do yeah, this no as problem. well. But um, as you talk about the struggles, you started a small business. I assume when you you started this, it was very very small. How many employees did you start with when you got uh, things going here? Just you, my brother and I. Just yeah. you, just just the two of you, and you've grown yeah. it into two hundred. Um, maybe a couple lessons learned in that process. Uh, we get quite a few entrepreneurs that uh, watch this, and that's a, right now that word entrepreneur is another one like big data that's hot, right? Yep. Everybody's starting entrepreneur podcasts, and there's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff going around that. Mm -hmm. But maybe a couple lessons learned just as you grew your business? Sure. I mean, I could talk about this topic all day. It's, <laughs> it's probably the thing I'm most passionate about is this notion of entrepreneurship, and I've been a student of entrepreneurship really my entire, my entire adult life. Um, I think... You know, it's important to read, to listen to interviews, uh, to go out and get information and um, and model the great entrepreneurs of our time. I think that entrepreneurs are uh, really change makers in a tremendous way in a world where, uh, you know, simultaneously we have all these amazing technologies and we're talking about as a subtext how great everything is and all this amazing technology. And, you know, there's a lot of big problems right now in the world and uh, there's a lot of uh, environmental destruction and geopolitical turmoil and, and things that um, aren't going to be easy to solve. And so reinventing our new ways of working and doing business and economies and uh, agriculture and healthcare and so forth, this is going to require uh, you know, empowered leadership of entrepreneurs uh, who are out there creating something from nothing, who are uh, essentially willing to step into the unknown. If I had to, you know, kind of sum up the, the most important advice for me at this point, I'd say it's just, you know, lean into the fear and try to overcome the fear that the uh, path of going in an unconventional direction is fraught with naysayers and fear mm -hmm. and uh, inner voices of criticism. And those are, those are the true, the, the inner voices of resistance are the true enemies um, of progress. And um, anything is possible right now. It's, it's more possible. Uh, entrepreneurship is uh, completely being unleashed in phenomenal ways. You know, my story is one small example of how, you know, a couple guys from the Midwest with no money could start something and, and go out and make it on their own. And, um, and I think that that opportunity exists for everyone. So uh, just do it and, uh, you know, Get over, get over the fear as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I didn't plan it this way. Gallup, you know, like the Strengths Finder. Gallup has a brand new called the Entrepreneurial Strengths Finder. Oh, nice! An assessment that you I'd can love take. To see yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's a, it, um, and actually some new pricing available on that coming out to just last night, which is really nice. So for less than fifteen bucks, you can go out and take an assessment that tells you some things about your strengths in entrepreneurialism. Nice. That that being said, we also track the numbers, and we know that there's more. For the first time ever, uh, more jobs are, or more businesses are closing than are opening here in the United States. So mm -hmm. entrepreneurialism very important from Super that important. standpoint as well. Yep. Last question: What keeps you awake at night? You're you're the business owner, <laughs> right? What keeps you awake? What's the number one thing besides coffee? That, yeah, that yeah, the number one thing that kind of keeps you awake at night. Um, I think that you know we've been super blessed, uh, and so. We are trying to apply our talents and skills uh, as effectively as we can in pursuit of hopefully some some big ideas that will make an impact. And um, but I, I do have a uh, a bit of worry about the state of affairs of our world, mm. and I think that there are a lot of challenges that we're not necessarily addressing fast enough. And so I do feel this sense of urgency uh, right now that uh, we need to come together as a global community and really think about problems that transcend just our local uh, communities and that just transcend, they affect our local communities, but they can't just be solved within localized manners. They have to be uh, addressed at global scales. And which ironically though oftentimes is is also a, a local approach and solution. So I think I think urgency is one thing that, that keeps me up at night. Other than that, you know, we have an amazing team 
um, and we're in the office every day. We're cranking hard. We're working, you know, crazy hours each week. And so I think the uh, just the general buzz of being in a heavy product development cycle inside of Silicon Valley in 2014 is is something that uh, you know probably shaves a couple hours off of the sleep cycle. Uh, well, if you're anything like me, you just don't sleep very much. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Ariana Huffington has a great quote. She says, the uh, the key is sleep your way to the top uh, <laughs> because it, it really is important that you it get is. as much sleep uh, as possible in, in eight hours. And, and although I didn't live it last night, I, I am a true believer yeah. in that. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to get. I, I'm a five-hour guy. Mm. I just, and maybe it's just because I'm getting older, but I have trouble. Eight hours seems weird <laughs> to me. I just, uh, you got so many things going on. It's, uh, it's just one of those deals. So... Yep. Matthew, thanks for taking a few minutes yeah, to be with us. It's great time. to see you. Welcome Appreciate back it. to Omaha. Good luck yeah. uh, with, with your endeavors and, and what you do. We'll certainly watch out for that. If folks wanted to kind of, what's a great site to go to to kind of see what you guys are yeah. doing? Yeah, uh, inflection.com. Okay, uh, let's spell that. Uh, I-N-F-L-E-C-T-I-O-N.com, like an inflection good. point. Inflection.com, and then you can go out there and see that. We're live from uh, Infotech 2014 here in Omaha.